This reading is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. Stillwater's Revival Books is online at www.puritandownloads.com. A Christian on the Mount, a treatise concerning meditation by Thomas Watson. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Psalm 1, verse 2. Having led you through the chamber of delight in a previous discourse, I will now bring you into the withdrawing room of meditation. In his law does he meditate day and night. One, the opening of the words and the proposition asserted. Grace breeds delight in God, and delight breeds meditation Meditation is a duty wherein consists the essentials of religion and which nourishes the very lifeblood of it, that the psalmist may show how much the godly man is habituated to this blessed work of meditation. He subjoins, in his law does he meditate day and night. Not but that there may be sometimes intermission, God allows time for our calling. He grants some relaxation. But when it is said, the godly man meditates day and night, the meaning is frequently. He is much conversant in the duty. It is a command of God to pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. The meaning is, Not that we should be always praying, but that we should every day set some time apart for prayer. We read in the old law, it was called the continual sacrifice, Numbers 28-24. Not that the people of Israel did nothing else but sacrifice, but because they had their stated hours. Every morning and evening they offered, and therefore it was called the continual sacrifice. Thus the godly man is said to meditate day and night. That is, he is often at this work. He is no stranger to meditation. The proposition that results out of the text is this, that a godly Christian is a meditating Christian. Psalm 119, verse 15. I will meditate in your precepts. 1 Timothy 4.15 Meditate upon these things. Meditation is the chewing upon the truths we have heard. The beasts in the old law which did not chew the cud were unclean. The professor who does not by meditation chew the cud is to be accounted unclean. Meditation is like the watering of the seed. It makes the fruits of grace to flourish. Roman numeral 2, showing the nature of meditation. If it be inquired what meditation is, I answer, meditation is the soul's retiring of itself, that by a serious and solemn thinking upon God, the heart may be raised up to heavenly affections. This description has three branches. First, meditation is the soul's retiring of itself. A Christian, when he goes to meditate, must lock up himself from the world. The world spoils meditation. Christ went by himself into the mountainside to pray. Matthew 14:23. So, go into a solitary place when you are to meditate. Isaac went out to meditate in the field. Genesis 24:63 He sequestered and retired himself that he might take a walk with God by meditation. Zacchaeus had a mind to see Christ and he got up out of the crowd. He ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. Luke 19:3 and 4. So when we would see God, we must get out of the crowd of worldly business. We must Climb up into the tree by a retiredness of meditation, and there we shall have the best prospect of heaven. The world's music will either play us asleep or distract us in our meditations. 
When a moat has gotten into the eye, it hinders the sight. And just so when worldly thoughts as motes are gotten into the mind, which is the eye of the soul, it cannot look up so steadfastly to heaven by contemplation. And therefore, as when Abraham went to sacrifice, he left his servant and the donkey at the bottom of the hill, Genesis 22.5. And so when a Christian is going up the hill of meditation, he should leave all secular cares at the bottom of the hill, that he may be alone and take a turn in heaven. If the wings of the bird are full of slime, she cannot fly. Meditation is the wing of the soul. When a Christian is beslimed with earth, he cannot fly to God upon this wing. Bernard, when he came to the church door, used to say, Stay here, all my worldly thoughts, that I may converse with God in the temple. And so say to yourself, I'm going now to meditate. Oh, all you vain thoughts, stay behind. Come not near. When you're going up the mount of meditation, take heed that the world does not follow you and throw you down from the top of this pinnacle. This is the first thing. The soul's retiring of itself. Lock and bolt the door against the world. The second thing in meditation is a serious and solemn thinking upon God. The Hebrew word to meditate signifies with intenseness to recollect and gather together the thoughts. Meditation is not a cursory work and to have a few transient thoughts of religion like the dogs of Nilus that, that lap and then run away. But there must be in meditation a fixing the heart upon the object, a, a steeping the thoughts. Carnal professors have their thoughts roving up and down and will not fix on God, like the bird that hops from one branch to another and stays in no one place. And David was a man fit to meditate. Oh God, my heart is fixed, Psalm 108, verse 1. In meditation there must be a, a staying of the thoughts upon the object. A man who rides quickly through a t town or village, he minds nothing. But an artist who is looking on a curious piece views the whole portraiture of it. He observes the symmetry and proportion. He minds every shadow and color. A carnal, flitting professor is like the traveler. His thoughts ride hastily. He minds nothing of God. A wise Christian is like the artist. He views with seriousness and ponders the things of religion. Luke 2:19. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. The third thing in meditation is the raising of the heart to holy affections. A Christian enters into meditation as a man enters into the hospital that he may be healed. Meditation heals the soul of its deadness and earthliness. But more of this afterwards. Roman numeral three, proving meditation to be a duty. Meditation is a duty lying upon every Christian, and there's no disputing our duty. Meditation is a duty, first imposed and second opposed. Meditation is a duty imposed. It is not arbitrary. The same God who has bid us believe has bid us meditate. Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. These words, though spoken to the person of Joshua, yet they concern everyone. As the promise made to Joshua concerned all believers, Joshua 1.5, compared with Hebrews 13.5. So this precept made to the person of Joshua, you shall meditate in this book of the law, takes in all Christians. As God's word does direct, so his will must enforce obedience. Meditation is a duty opposed we may conclude it is a good duty because it is against the stream of corrupt nature. As one said, you may know that religion is right, which Nero persecutes. So you may know that 
what is a good duty which the heart opposes. We shall find naturally a strange averseness from meditation. We're swift to hear, but slow to meditate. To think of the world if it were all day long is is delightful. But as for holy meditation, how does the heart wrangle and quarrel with this duty? It's like a doing of penance. Now truly there needs no other reason to prove a duty to be good than the reluctancy of a carnal heart. To instance in the duty of let a man deny himself, Matthew 16:24, self-denial is as necessary as heaven, but what disputes are raised in the heart against it? What? And to deny my reason and become a fool that I may be wise? Nay, not only to deny my reason, but my righteousness? What? To cast it overboard and swim to heaven upon the plank of Christ's merits? Now this is such a duty that the heart does naturally oppose and enter its dissent against. This is an argument to prove the duty of self-denial good. Just so it is with this duty of meditation. The secret antipathy the heart has against it shows it to be good. And this is reason enough to enforce meditation. Roman numeral four. Showing how meditation differs from memory. The memory, a glorious faculty, which Aristotle calls the soul's scribe, sits and pens all things that are done. Whatever we read or hear, the memory does register. Therefore, God does all his works of wonder that they may be had in remembrance. There seems to be some analogy and resemblance between meditation and memory. But I can see there is a double difference. First, meditation has more sweetness in it than the bare remembrance. The memory is the chest or cupboard to lock up a truth. Meditation is the palate to feed on it. The memory is like the ark in which the manna was laid up. Meditation is like Israel's eating of manna. When David began to meditate on God, it was sweet to him as marrow. Psalm 63, verses 5 and 6. There is as much difference between a truth remembered and a truth meditated on as between a cordial in a glass and a cordial drunk down. Secondly, the remembrance of a truth without the serious meditation on it will but create matter of sorrow another day. What comfort can it be to a man when he comes to die to think he remembered many excellent notions about Christ but never had the grace so to meditate on them as to be transformed into them? A sermon remembered but not ruminated will only serve to increase a condemnation. Roman numeral 5, showing how meditation differs from study. The student's life looks like meditation, but does vary from it. Meditation and study differ three ways. First, they differ in their nature. Study is a work of the brain, meditation of the heart. Study sets the mind on work. Meditation sets the heart on work. Secondly, they differ in their design. The design of study is notion. The design of meditation is piety. The design of study is the finding out of a truth. The design of meditation is the spiritual improvement of a truth. The one searches for the vein of gold. The other digs out the gold. Three, they differ in the outcome and result. Study leaves a man never a whit the better. It's like a winter sun that has little warmth and influence. Meditation leaves one in a holy frame. It melts the heart when it is frozen and makes it drop into tears of love. Roman numeral six, showing the subjects of meditation. The next particular to be discussed is the subject matter of meditation. What a Christian should meditate upon. 
I have now gotten into a large field, but I shall only glance at things. I shall but do as the disciples, pluck some ears of corn as I pass along. Some may say, Alas, I am so barren, I know not what to meditate upon. And to help Christians, therefore, in this blessed work, I shall show you some choice select matter for meditation. There are 15 things in the Word of God which we should principally meditate upon. Section 1, meditate on God's attributes. Now, the attributes of God are the several beams by which the divine nature shines forth to us. And there are six special attributes which we should fix our meditations upon. First, meditate upon God's omniscience. His eye is continually upon us. He has a window open into the conscience. Our thoughts are unveiled before him. He can tell the words we speak in our bedchamber, 2 Kings 2.12. He is described with seven eyes to show his omniscience. You number my steps, Job 14.16. The Hebrew word signifies to take an exact account. God is said to number our steps when he makes a precise and critical observation of our actions. God sets down every step of our lives and keeps it, as it were, a, a day book of all we do and enters it down into the book. Meditate much on this omniscience. Meditation on God's omniscience would have these effects. First, it would be as a bridle to check and restrain us from sin. Will the thief steal when the judge looks on? To meditation on God's omniscience would be a good means to make the heart sincere. God has set a window in every man's breast. Does not he see all my ways? Job 31.4 if I harbor proud, malicious thoughts, if I look at my own interest more than Christ's, if I juggle in my repentance, the God of heaven takes notice. Meditation on his omniscience would make a Christian sincere, both in his actions and aims. Only a fool would dare to be a hypocrite before God. And then meditate on the holiness of God. Holiness is the embroidered robe God wears. It is the glory of the Godhead, Exodus 15:11. Glorious in holiness. Holiness is the most orient pearl of the crown of heaven. God is the exemplar and, and pattern of holiness. It is primarily and originally in God as light in the sun. You may as well separate weight from lead or heat from fire as holiness from the divine nature. God's holiness is that whereby his heart rises against any sin as being most diametrically opposed to his essence. Habakkuk 1.13 You are of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. Meditate much on this attribute. Meditation on God's holiness would have this effect. It would be a means to transform us into the similitude and likeness of God. God never loves us until we are like him. And there's a story of a deformed man who set lovely pictures before his wife that seeing them she might have lovely children and so she had be that as it may, while by meditation we are looking upon the beams of holiness, which are gloriously transparent in God, we shall grow like him and be holy as he is holy. Holiness is a beautiful thing, Psalm 110. It puts a kind of angelical brightness upon us. It is the only coin which will pass current in heaven by the frequent meditation on this attribute we are changed into God's image. Next, meditate on the wisdom of God. He is called the only wise God, 1 Timothy 1.17. His wisdom shines forth in the works of providence. He sits at the helm, guiding all things regularly and harmoniously. 
He brings light out of darkness. He can strike a straight stroke by a crooked stick. He can make use of the injustice of men to do that which is just. He is infinitely wise. He breaks us by afflictions and upon these broken pieces of the ship brings us safely to shore. And meditate on the wisdom of God. Meditation on God's wisdom would sweetly calm our hearts. First, when we see things go badly in the public, the all-wise God holds the reins of government in His hand. And whoever the earthly ruler, God overrules. He knows how to turn all to good. His work will be beautiful in its season. And secondly, when things go badly with us in particular, the meditation on God's wisdom would rock our hearts quiet. The wise God has set me in this condition and and whether health or sickness, His wisdom will order it for the best. God will make a golden cordial from poison. All things shall be beneficial and medicinal to me. Either the Lord will expel some sin or exercise some grace. Meditation on this would silence murmuring. Then meditate on the power of God. His power is visible in the creation. He hangs the earth upon nothing. Job 26.7 What cannot that God do who can create? Nothing can stand before a creating power. He needs no pre-existent matter to work upon. He needs no instruments to work with. He can work without tools. He it is before whom the angels veil their faces and the kings of the earth cast their crowns. He it is who removes the earth out of her place. Job 9, 6. An earthquake makes the earth tremble upon her pillars, but God can shake it out of its place. God can, with a word, unpin the wheels and break the axle of the creation. He can suspend natural agents, stop the lion's mouth, cause the sun to stand still, make the fire not burn. Xerxes, the Persian monarch, threw fetters into the sea as if he would have chained up the unruly waters. But when God commands the winds and seas obey him, Matthew 8:27. He speaks the word. An army of stars appear, Judges 5.20. If he stamps with his foot, a multitude of angels are presently in battalia. If he lifts up an ensign and does but hiss, his very enemies shall be up in arms to revenge his quarrel, Isaiah 5.56. Who would provoke this God? It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10.31 As a lion, he tears in pieces his adversaries. Psalm 50.22 Oh, meditate on this power of God. Meditation on God's power would be a great stay to faith. A Christian's faith may anchor safely upon the rock of God's power. It was Samson's riddle, out of the strong came forth sweetness, Judges 14.14 While we are meditating on the power of God, out of this strong comes forth sweetness. Is the church of God low? He can create praises in heaven. In Jerusalem, Isaiah 65.28 Is your corruption strong? God can break the head of this Leviathan. Is your heart as hard as a stone? God can dissolve it. The Almighty makes my heart soft. Faith triumphs in the power of God. Out of this strong comes forth sweetness. Abraham, meditating on God's power, did not stagger through unbelief. Romans 4.20 He knew God could make a dead womb fruitful and dry breasts give suck. Next, meditate upon the mercy of God. Mercy is an innate disposition in God to do good, as the sun has an innate property to shine. Psalm 86, 5. You, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy, 
to all them that call upon you. God's mercy is so sweet that it makes all his other attributes sweet. Holiness without mercy and justice without mercy would be dreadful. Geographers write that the city of Syracuse in Sicily is curiously situated, that the sun is never out of sight. Though the children of God are under some clouds of affliction, yet the sun of mercy is never quite out of sight. God's justice reaches to the clouds. His mercy reaches above the clouds. How slow is God to anger. He was longer in destroying Jericho and then in making the world. He made the world in six days. He was seven days in demolishing the walls of Jericho. How many warning arrows did God shoot against Jerusalem before he shot off his destroying arrow? Justice goes by foot in Genesis 18:21, but mercy has wings. The sword of justice often lies a long time in the scabbard and rusts until sin draws it out and sharpens it against a nation. God's justice is like the widow's oil, which ran a while and ceased, 1 Kings 4, 6. God's mercy is like Aaron's oil, which rested not on his head, but ran down to the skirts of his garment, Psalm 133, 2. And so the golden oil of God's mercy does not rest upon the head of a godly parent, but is often poured on his children and so runs down to the third and fourth generation, even the borders of a pious seed. Often meditate upon the mercy of God. Meditation on mercy would be a powerful lodestone to draw sinners to God by repentance. It would be as a cork to the net to keep the heart from sinking in despair. Behold a city of refuge to fly to. God is the father of mercies, 2 Corinthians 1.3. Mercy does as naturally issue from him as the child from the parent. God delights in mercy, Micah 7.18. Chrysostom says, It is delightful to the mother to have her breasts drawn, and how delightful is it to God to have the breasts of mercy drawn. Mercy finds out the worst sinner. Mercy comes not only with salvation in its hand, but with healing under its wings. Meditation on God's mercy would melt a sinner into tears. One reading a pardon sent to him from the king fell a weeping and burst out into these words, A pardon has done that which death could not do. It has made my heart relent. And then meditate upon the truth of God. Mercy makes the promise and truth performs it. Psalm 89.33 I will not allow my faithfulness to fail. God can as well deny himself as his word. He is abundant in truth. Exodus 34.6 That is, if God has made a promise of mercy to his people. He will be so far from coming short of his word that he will be better than his word. God often does more than he has said, nevertheless. He often shoots beyond the mark of the promise he has set, never short of it. He is abundant in truth. God may sometimes delay a promise, but he will not deny it. The promise may lie a long time as seed hidden underground, but it is all the while a ripening. The promise of Israel's deliverance lay 430 years underground. But when the time was come, the promise did not go a day beyond its reckoning. Exodus 12:41. The strength of Israel will not lie. 1 Samuel 15:29. Meditation on God's truth. This would first be a, a pillar of support for your faith. The world hangs upon God's power. Faith hangs upon his truth. And secondly, meditation on God's truth would make us ambitious to imitate him. We should be true in our words, true in our dealings. Pythagoras being asked, what makes men like God? He answered, when they speak truth. And now we go to section two. Meditate upon 
not just the attributes of God, but the promises of God. The promises of God are flowers growing in the paradise of Scripture. Meditation, like the bee, sucks out the sweetness of them. The promises are of no use or comfort to us until they are meditated upon. Roses hanging in the garden may give a fragrant redolence, yet their, their sweet water is distilled only by the fire. And just so the promises are sweet in reading over, but the water of these roses, the spirits and quintess, quintessence of the promises are distilled into the soul only by meditation. The incense, when it is pounded and beaten, smells sweetest. Meditating on a promise like the beating of the incense makes it more fragrant and pleasant. The promises may be compared to a gold mine, which only enriches when the gold is dug out. By holy meditation we dig out that spiritual gold which lies hidden in the midst of the promise. And so we come to be enriched. Cardan says that every precious gemstone has some hidden virtue in it. They're called precious promises, 2 Peter 1.4. When they are applied by meditation, then their virtue appears and they become precious indeed. There are three sorts of promises which we should meditate upon. First, promises of remission. I even I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins, Isaiah 43:25. Whereas the poor sinner may say, Alas, I am deep in debt with God. I fear I have not filled his bottle with my tears, but I have filled his book with my debts. Well, true, but meditate on his promise. I am he who blots out. The word there in the original to blot out is a metaphor alluding to a merchant who, when his debtor has paid him, he blots out the debt and gives him an acquittance. And so says God, I will blot out your sin. I will cross out the debt book. In the Hebrew it is, I am blotting out your transgressions. I have taken my pen and am crossing out your debt. Oh, but may the sinner say, there's no reason God should do thus for me. Well, but it's true. But acts of grace do not go by reason. I will blot out your sins for my name's sake. Oh, but says the sinner, will not the Lord call my sins again to remembrance? No. He promises to send them into oblivion. I will not upbraid you with your sins. I will remember your sins no more. Here is a sweet promise to meditate upon. It is a hive full of the honey of the gospel. And then meditate upon promises of sanctification. The earth is not so apt to be overgrown with weeds and thorns as the heart is to be overgrown with lusts. Now God has made many promises of healing, Hosea 14.4, and purging, Jeremiah 33.8. Promises of sending His Spirit, Isaiah 44.3, which for its sanctifying nature is compared sometimes to water, which cleanses the vessel, sometimes to wind, which is the fan to winnow and purify the air, sometimes to fire, which refines the metals. Meditate often on that promise, Isaiah 1.18, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Scarlet is so deep a dye that all the art of man cannot take it out. But behold, here a promise. God will whiten the soul. He will make a scarlet sinner into a snow-white saint. By virtue of this refining and consecrating work, a Christian is made partaker of the divine nature. He has a suitability and fitness to have communion with God forever. Meditate much on this promise. And then thirdly, meditate upon promises of remuneration. The haven of rest, Hebrews 4.9, the beautiful, beatifical sight of God. 
Uh, Matthew 5, 8. The glorious mansions, John 14, 2. Meditation on these promises will be as choice cordials to keep us from fainting under our sins and sorrows. And then the next section, 3. Meditate upon the love of Christ. Christ is full of love as he is of merit. What was it but love that he should save us and not the fallen angels? Among the rarities of the lodestone, this is not the least, that leaving the gold and pearl, it should draw iron to it, which is a baser kind of metal, just so that Christ should leave the angels, those more noble spirits, the gold and pearl, and draw mankind to him. How does this proclaim his love? Love was the wing on which he flew into the virgin's womb. Number one, how transcendent is Christ's love to the saints? The apostle calls it a love which passes knowledge, Ephesians 3.19. It is such a love as God the Father bears to Christ. The same for quality, though not equality, John 15.9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. A believer's heart is the garden where Christ has planted this sweet flower of his love. It is the channel through which the golden stream of his affection runs. Number two, how sovereign is Christ's love? Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. 1 Corinthians 1.26 in the old law, God passed by the noble lion and the eagle and took the dove for sacrifice. That God should pass by so many of noble birth and abilities and that the lot of free grace should fall upon me. Oh, the depth of divine grace. Number three, how invincible is the love of Christ. It is strong as death. Song of Solomon 8, 6. Death might take away Christ's life, but not his love. Neither can our sin wholly quench that divine flame of love. The church had her infirmities, her sleepy fits, but though blacked and sullied, yet she is still a dove. Christ could see the faith and wink at the failing. He who painted Alexander drew him with his finger over the scar on his face. And just so, Christ puts the finger of mercy upon the scars of the saints. He will not throw away his pearls for every speck of dirt. That which makes this love of Christ the more stupendous is that there was nothing in us to excite or draw forth his love. He did not love us because we were worthy, but by loving us, he made us worthy. Number four, how immutable is Christ's love. Having loved his own, he loved them to the end, John 13, 1. The saints are like letters of gold engraved upon Christ's heart, which cannot be erased out. Meditate much upon the love of Christ, because, number one, serious meditation on the love of Christ would make us love him in return. Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burnt? Proverbs 6, 28. Who can tread by meditation upon these hot coals of Christ's love and his heart not burn in love to him? And secondly, meditation on Christ's love would set our eyes abroach with tears for our gospel unkindnesses. Oh, that we should sin against so sweet a Savior. Had we none to abuse but our best friend? Had we nothing to kick against? but affections of love? Did not Christ suffer enough upon the cross? But must we needs make him suffer more? Do we give him more gall and vinegar to drink? Oh, if anything can dissolve the heart into mourning, it is the unkindness offered to Christ. When Peter thought of Christ's love to him, Christ could deny Peter nothing, yet he, he could deny Christ. This made his eyes to water. Peter went out and wept bitterly. Thirdly, thirdly, meditation on Christ's love would make us love our enemies. Jesus Christ showed love to his enemies. 
We read of the fire licking up the water in 1 Kings 18.38. It's usual for water to quench fire, but for fire to dry up and consume the water, which was not capable of burning, this is miraculous. Such a miracle did Christ show. His love burned where there was no fit matter to work upon, nothing but sin and enmity. He loved his enemies. The fire of his love consumed and licked up the water of their sins. He prayed for his enemies. Father, forgive them. He shed his tears for those who shed his blood. Such a miracle. Such a miracle. Uh, Father, forgive them, he said. Those who gave him gall and vinegar to drink, to them he gave his sin-forgiving blood to drink. Meditation on his love should melt our hearts in love to our enemies. Augustine says Christ made a pulpit of the cross and the great lesson he taught Christians was to love their enemies. And four, meditation on Christ's love would be a means to support us in case of his absence. Sometimes he is pleased to withdraw himself. And yet when we consider how entire and immutable his love is, it will make us wait with patience until he sweetly manifests himself to us. He is love. He cannot forsake his people very long. Micah 7.19 The sun may be gone a while from our climate, but it returns in the spring. Meditation on Christ's love may make us wait for the return of this sun of righteousness. Hebrews 10.37 For yet a little while, and he who shall come will come. He is truth. Therefore, he shall come. He is love. Therefore, he will come. And now section four. Meditate upon sin. Yes, number one, meditate on the guilt of sin. We are in Adam as in a common head or root. And he sinning, we have become guilty. Romans 5.12 Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way death came to all men because all sinned. By his treason our blood is tainted. This guilt brings shame with it as its twin. Romans 6.21 So number two, meditate upon the filth of sin. Not only is the, the guilt of Adam's sin imputed, but the poison of his nature is disseminated to us. Our virgin nature is defiled. If the heart is spotted, how then can the actions be pure? If the water in the well is foul, it cannot be clean in the bucket. Isaiah 64, 6, we are all as an unclean thing. We are like a patient under the physician's care who has no sound part in him. His head is bruised. His liver is swelled. His lungs are gasping. His blood is infected. His, his feet are gangrened. Thus it is with us before saving grace comes. In the mind there is darkness. In the memory there is slipperiness. In the heart there is hardness. In the will there is stubbornness. You are sick from head to foot, covered with bruises, welts and infected wounds, without any ointments or bandages. Isaiah 1.6 a sinner be filthied with sin is no better than a devil in man's shape. And which is sadly to be laid to heart, and this is the adherency of this sin, sin is natural to us. The apostle calls it the sin that so easily ensnares us. Hebrew 12.1 Sin is not easily cast off. A man may as well shake off the skin of his body as the sin of his soul. There is no shaking off this viper until death. Oh, often meditate on this contagion of sin. How strong is that poison? A drop whereof is able to poison a whole sea. How venomous and malignant was that apple, a taste of which poisoned all mankind. Meditate sadly on this. Meditation on sin would make the plumes of pride fall off. If our knowledge makes us proud, that is sin enough to make us humble. The best saint alive 
who is taken out of the grave of sin, yet has the smell of the grave clothes still upon him. Meditate upon the curse of sin. Galatians 3.10 Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. This curse is like a deadly canker upon fruit which keeps it from thriving. Sin is not only a defiling thing, but a damning thing. It is not only a spot in the face, but a stab at the heart. Sin betrays us into the devil's hands, who writes all his laws in blood. Sin binds us over to the wrath of God. What then? Are all our earthly enjoyments with the sword of divine vengeance hanging over our head? Sin brings forth a scroll written with curses against a sinner, Zechariah 5.5. 5. And it is a flying scroll. It comes swiftly if mercy does not stop it. You are cursed with a curse, Matthew 3.9. Thus it is until the head of this curse is cut off by Christ. Oh, meditate upon this curse due to sin. Because, number one, meditation on this curse would make us afraid of retaining sin. When Micah had stolen his mother's money and heard her curse him, he dared not keep it any longer, but restored it, Judges 17.2. He was afraid of his mother's curse. What then is God's curse? And secondly, meditation on this curse would make us afraid of entertaining sin. We would not willingly entertain one in our house who had a deadly plague. Sin brings along with it the plague of God's curse, which cleaves to a sinner. Meditation on this would make us fly from sin. While we sit under the shadow of this bramble of sin, fire will come out of the bramble eternally to devour us. Judges 9.15 And now section 5. Meditate upon the vanity of of the creature, the created one. When you have sifted out the finest flour that the creature can give, you will find something either to dissatisfy or nauseate. The best wine has its froth, the sweetest rose has its prickles, and the purest comforts have their dregs. The creature cannot be said to be full unless we say that it is full of vanity, as a sail may be filled with wind, Job twenty twenty two. At the height of his success, distress will come to him. The full weight of misery will crush him. Now, those who think to find happiness here on earth are like Apollo, who embraced a tree instead of the lovely Daphne. Meditate on this vanity of the creature. The world is like a broken looking glass, which shows a false beauty. Meditation on worldly vanity would be like the digging about the roots of a tree to loosen it from the earth. It would much loosen our hearts from the world and be an excellent preservative against the love of earthly things. Let a Christian think thus with himself, Why am I so serious about such a worthless vanity? If the whole earth were changed into a globe of gold, it could not fill my heart. And secondly, a meditation on the creature's vanity would make us look after more solid comforts. The favor of God, the blood of Christ, the influences of the Spirit. When I see that the life which I fetch from the cistern is vain, I'll go to the more to the ocean. In Christ there is an inexhaustible treasury. When a man finds the bough begin to break, he lets go of the bough and catches hold on the trunk of the tree, just so. When we find the creation, the created one, to be but a rotten bough, then by faith we shall catch hold on Christ, the tree of life. Revelation 2.7 The creature is but a shaking reed. God is the immovable rock of ages. And section 6. Meditate on the excellency of grace. Number one, grace is precious in itself. Second Peter 1.1, 1, 1, precious faith. Grace is precious in its original, 
It comes from above, James 3.17, and grace is precious in its nature. It is the seed of God, 1 John 3.9. Grace is the spiritual embroidery of the soul. It's the very signature and engraving of the Holy Spirit. Grace does not lose its color. It is such a commodity that the longer we keep it, the better it is. It changes into glory. And secondly, as grace is precious in itself, so it makes us precious to God. As a rich diamond adorns the one who wears it, Isaiah 43, 4, since you were precious in my sight. The saints who are invested with grace are God's jewels, Malachi 3.17, though sullied with reproach, though besmeared with blood, yet jewels. All the world besides is but chaff. These are the jewels, and heaven is the golden cabinet where they shall be locked up safe. A gracious man is the glory of the age he lives in, and so illustrious in God's eye is a soul bespangled with grace that he does not think the world worthy of him, Hebrews 11.38 of whom the world was not worthy. Therefore God calls his people home so fast because they are too good to live in this world. Proverbs 2.26, the righteous is more excellent than his neighbor. Grace is the best blessing. It has a transcendency above all other things. There are two things which sparkle much in our eyes, but grace infinitely outshines both. One, gold. The sun does not shine so much in our eyes as gold. It's the mirror of beauty. Money answers all things, Ecclesiastes 10.19, but grace weighs heavier than gold. Gold draws the heart from God. Grace draws the heart to God. Gold does, not, but, does but enrich the mortal part. Grace, the angelic part. Gold perishes, grace perseveres. The rose, the fuller it is blown, the sooner it sheds. The rose is an emblem of all things besides grace. And then gifts. These are nature's pride. Gifts and abilities, like Rachel, are fair to look upon, but grace excels. I'd rather be holy than eloquent. A heart full of grace is better than a head full of notions. Gifts commend no man to God. It is not the skin of the apple we esteem, though of a vermilion color, but the fruit. We judge not the better of a horse for his trappings and ornaments unless he has good metal. What are the most glorious abilities if there is not the metal of grace in the heart? Gifts may be bestowed upon one for the good of others, as the nurse's breasts are given her for the child, but grace is bestowed for a man's own eternal advantage. God may send away reprobates with gifts, as Abraham gave the sons of the concubines some gifts, Genesis 25, 6, but he entails the inheritance only upon grace. Oh, often meditate upon the excellency of grace. The musing on the beauty of grace, number one, would make us fall in love with it, he who meditates on the worth of a diamond crows in love with it. Damascene calls the graces of the Spirit the very characters and impressions of the divine nature. Grace is that flower of delight which, like the vine in the parable, Judges 9.13, cheers the heart of God and man. And secondly, meditation on the excellency of grace would make us earnest in the pursuit after it. We dig for gold in the mine. We sweat for it in the furnace. Did we meditate on the worth of grace? We would dig in the mine of ordinances for it. What sweating and wrestling in prayer would we have? We would put on a modest boldness and not take a denial. What will you give me, says Abraham, seeing I go childless, Genesis 15, 2. And so would the soul say, Lord, what will you give me, seeing I go graceless? Who will give me to drink of the water of the well of life? And thirdly, meditation on the excellency of grace would make us endeavor to be instrumental to convey grace to others. Is grace so transcend transcendentally precious? And have I a child who lacks grace? 
Oh, that I might be a means to convey this treasure into his soul. I have read of a rich Florentine who, being about to die, called all his sons together and used these words to them. It much rejoices me now upon my deathbed that I shall leave you all wealthy. But a parent's ambition should be rather to convey sanctity that he may say, Oh, my children, it rejoices me that I shall leave you gracious. It comforts me that before I die, I shall see Jesus Christ live in you. Section 7. Meditate upon your spiritual state. Enter into a serious meditation on the state of your souls. While you are meditating on other things, do not forget yourselves. The great work lies at home. It was Solomon's advice. Know the state of your flock. Proverbs 27, 23. Much more know the state of your soul. For lack of this meditation, men are like travelers, skilled in other countries but ignorant of their own. And so they know other things but know not how it goes with their souls, whether they are in a good state or bad. There are few who by holy meditation enter within themselves. There are two reasons why so few meditate upon the state of their souls. First, self-guiltiness. Men are reluctant to look into their hearts by meditation, lest they should find that things that would trouble them, the cup is in their sack. Uh, most are herein like tradesmen who, being ready to sink in their estates, are reluctant to look into their account books, lest they should find their estate low. But had you not better enter into your heart by meditation, then God should in a sad manner enter into judgment with you. Secondly, presumption. Men hope all is well. Men will not take their land upon trust, but will have it surveyed. Yet they will take their spiritual estate upon trust uh, without any surveying. They are confident their case is good. Proverbs 14, 16. They presume that it's a thing not to be disputed on, and this confidence is but conceit. The foolish virgins, though they had no oil in their lamps, yet how confident were they? They came knocking. They doubted not of admittance. Just so many do not possess salvation, but remain secure. And they presume all is well, never seriously meditating whether they have oil or not. O oh, Christian, meditate about your soul. See how the case stands between God and you. Do as merchants. Cast up your estate that you may see what you are worth. See if you are rich towards God, Luke 12, 21. Meditate about three things. First, about your debts. See if your debts are paid or not. That is, your sins pardoned. See if there be no arrears, uh, no sin in your soul unrepented of. Secondly, meditate about your will. And see if your will is made yet. Have you resigned up all the interest in yourself? Have you given up your love to God? Have you given up your will? This is to make your will. Meditate about your will. Make your spiritual will in the time of health. If you put off the making of your will until death, it may be invalid. Perhaps God will not accept of your soul then. And then third, meditate about your evidences. These evidences are the graces of the Spirit. See whether you have any evidences. What desires have you after Christ? What faith? See whether there are any flaws in your evidences. Are your desires true? Do you as well desire heavenly principles as heavenly privileges? Oh, meditate seriously upon your evidences. To sift our hearts thus by meditation is very necessary. If we find our state is not sound, the mistake is discovered. The danger can be prevented. If our spiritual estate is sound, we shall have the comfort of it. What gladness was it to Hezekiah when he could say, Remember now, O Lord, how I have walked before you in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in your sight. Isaiah 38, 3. <clears throat> so what unspeakable comfort will it be when a Christian, upon a serious meditation and review of his spiritual condition, can say, 
I have something to show for heaven. I know I have passed from death to life, 1 John 3.14. And as a holy man once said, I am Christ's and the devil has nothing to do with me. This is the end of part one of A Christian on the Mount, a treatise concerning meditation by Thomas Watson. Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan Hard Drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s, and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.